And so I'm going to begin with. So my name is Carol Essex, and I'm a member of Etobicoke Climate Action. And we have um, gathered these people here today to put on this webinar for you, which uh, is hopefully giving you some great uh, solutions for uh, how to find electric vehicle charging. Uh, if you're thinking about buying an electric vehicle, because uh, a lot of people are thinking about it now. It's going to end up saving you hugely. You won't have to pay for all that gas. Of course, you have the initial outlay of your of your car purchase, whether it's used or new or whatever. But you will save money and you'll also be helping the environment hugely because, as we know, transportation vehicles are a huge source of pollution, a, a huge a source of the... Uh, the carbon that's creating the global warming. So um, welcome to Etobicoke Climate Action's webinar on EV charging solutions. And Etobicoke Climate Action is a nonpartisan group of volunteers, and we are working together to build awareness of the climate crisis and to create solutions through advocacy and local initiatives. And if you want to find us, we're easy to find. It's www.etobicoclimateaction.ca. And you can see what events we've done in the past and events that we're going to be doing in the future. I'm going to start off with a land acknowledgement. This land in Etobicoke is the traditional territory of the Huron, Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit River. The name Etobicoke is an indigenous name derived from Wado Bekang, meaning place where alder trees grow in the Anish Nabamoan Ojibwe language of the Mississaugas. These people lived on this land for thousands of years before the European settlers arrived. And at this point in history, they still have much knowledge about the stewardship of this land called Turtle Island. And we have yet to resolve many of the treaty agreements that we made with First Nations people. Coming up on September the 30th, a reminder, it's Orange Shirt Day and the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. And there's going to be a lot of activities that you could join up with. Um, so on September the 30th, remember that every child matters. Listen to the survivors of residential schools Honor those who didn't make it and stand up for truth and reconciliation. And one place where they're having a lot of celebration that would be easy to find would be the uh, television channel APTN. They're going to have celebrations all day long. So I'm going to pass it over to Alex Cameron. He's also a member of Etobicoke Climate Action and he's doing the tech for us this evening. He's going to explain to you the question and answer process. Alex. Good evening. Whoops. I don't have my video started. There. I have my video started. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I know how to start my video, so I must be the tech guy. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, what we're going to do is use the Zoom Q&A uh, feature. So when you open the Q, when you click on the Q&A button down on the tools at the bottom, it'll open up the Q&A box and you can ask a question or upvote a question. Um, and it's important to upvote questions as well as ask questions because that way we'll know uh, which questions are most uh, of interest to the audience because we will have limited time for questions at the end. And that's really all there is to it. Thanks very much. Um, and Alex, are we going to be able to, um, there's a little bit of uh, chat that's able to be used. The way the chat is set right now, uh, members of the uh, uh, panel can send chat messages to the audience. So if you've got a hyperlink or a message that you want to share with the audience, you can type it into the chat. But members of the audience can't chat back and forth amongst themselves or with the panelists. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> okay, so... Um... The first speaker of the evening is uh, Brian McLean, and 
Brian is also a founding member of Etobicoke Climate Action. His full-time volunteer work also includes Lost Rivers Toronto, Parkdale Intercultural Association. He is a neighborhood climate action champion for Transform TO, which is the big initiative from the city of Toronto. And he is a Toronto nature steward at Etobicoke's Raymar Park. So he has a lot of activity uh, activism going on. And uh, and we welcome you, Brian. Thank you, Carol. And thank you, Alex. Um, so uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we're assuming that everyone who's um, who's uh, attending tonight is um, is interested in looking into purchasing an electric vehicle and is wondering how they will uh, how they will manage that, how they will power that. So um, we're, we're uh, focused on uh, charging solutions this evening, and I just wanted to give you a, um, a quick overview before our main speaker, Anne, um, about the city's um, uh, commitment so far to um, supporting uh, electric vehicles. Um, so I'll, I'll first say that uh, this is a part of the um, city's uh, Transform TO um, Climate Plan Action. And I'm going to show you, uh, here we are, that um, in, in the city, uh, in the last um, inventory, sort of uh, assessment of where our greenhouse gas emissions are coming from, 36% um, of them are coming from transportation. And that's primarily private vehicles. Um, cars and EV, uh, SUVs and uh, and pickup trucks and so forth, not not the big um, commercial tractor trailers and so forth. Most of it is coming from you and I driving cars around town and and beyond. Um, the single biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions is buildings, and that's a whole other topic for another occasion. But transportation is a huge challenge that we've got to try to tackle. So the um, the city. Uh, just presented to city council, the staff just presented to city council a, um, an updated electric vehicle strategy implementation uh, update. And that outlines what they are um, uh, committed to doing themselves with their own fleets and their own, um, uh, their own uh, buildings, um, and also what they're doing for the rest of us. Uh, to help us, um, you know, keep our, our EVs charged. So they say that, um, uh, for example, the parking authority, that the parking authority that manages all the Green P parking lots, you know, will be installing charging stations. There'll be on-street charging stations as well, um, basically, you know, next to a, a parking meter. Um, their goal is to install 650 charging stations across the city uh, by 2024, two years from now, less than two years from now. Um, their own fleet, as I say, they're moving towards zero emissions from their own fleet. So in stages, I think in the next two years, they want 20% of their vehicles to be zero emission or EVs uh, and so on through to 2030. So we have um, huge need to uh, to move fast in all of these areas um, and uh, your interest in in transitioning to an EV is certainly a big part of the solution the other part um, so EVs are are a, a big part of the strategy to, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from transportation the other strategy is to in, encourage and enable more of us to walk or bicycle or take transit instead of drive around in a personal automobile. Um, so their goal here is by 2030 that 75% of the trips we take that are five kilometers or less, um, that they be either walked, biked, or um, that you take a, a bus or subway or streetcar. So that's a huge change. And that means we out here in the suburbs, which were designed um, for you know, car travel primarily, um, some streets don't even have sidewalks. 
um, that we have to change the way our, our neighborhoods are organized so that uh, our basic services and stores and so forth are closer to us and, and that it's um, safe and friendly and inviting that you walk or cycle there instead of hop in the car to go buy something at the drugstore or you know, a bit of food at a, at a grocery store. So um, that, that's a really interesting challenge for a suburban uh, area like ours to transition in that way. So that's the other side of the transportation uh, transformation that we're looking for. So um, I think that's everything I wanted to, to tell you quickly. Um, I'll put in the chat links to um, the city's transform TO um, document and a recent update with their commitments over, um, over a period of time to work on the buildings and transportation uh, to, to, to reduce um, uh, you know, our, our greenhouse gas emissions. And then finally, this, this new document, which was just, um, just produced a couple of months ago, the uh, City of Toronto's electric vehicle strategy, which is most appropriate for our topic tonight. So thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you, Brian. Um, I want to read that document. I haven't, I didn't even know about that till just now. Um, so our next speaker is Anne Didier, and she is also my sister-in-law. And she lives in downtown Toronto. And in the summertime, um, I was visiting Anne with my daughter and the grandkids, uh, visiting Anne and my brother out at their cottage. And she got talking to me about this electric vehicle idea that she had. Uh, and and uh, I said, oh, this sounds like a great idea for a webinar for Tropical Climate Action. So that's how this whole webinar came about. Just Anne and I having that conversation. So um, I would like to uh, introduce you to my sister-in-law, Anne, and here she is. Good evening, everyone. As Carol mentioned, my name is Anne Didier, and I am most definitely am not an expert when it comes to electric vehicles or chargers. However, out of necessity, since I want to purchase an electric or plug-in hybrid vehicle and live in a condo, I was forced to learn what I could and realized as well that I needed to make a presentation to the condo in regards to why it is I thought it would be beneficial for them to have electric chargers in the building. I also recognize that sometimes when it is that you're making a presentation to the condo board, if you then leave them with a lot of work for them to do afterwards in order to learn about the requirements or they don't know who to contact, that if you can provide them with that information, it's helpful. So that's what it is that I chose to do. And as a result, developed a short um, PowerPoint presentation that I'm going to share with you. And just so that you have an idea of perhaps if you're in a condo, considering going to your board, looking to install chargers, that it may be helpful to you. Just so you know, um, while I presented it in May over the holiday, our board doesn't, oh, sorry, over the summer, our board doesn't meet a lot. So as of yet, I don't have a decision. But um, hopefully, because a number of other people also spoke to the fact that they'd be interested in having chargers in the garage in our building. So hopefully I will have a positive response as a result. So I'll just share my screen with you now. So as I mentioned, this is what it is that I presented to our condo board, just an overview of what it was that I was going to present, EVs, the process, the law, the steps as far as the legislation, benefits, steps in the process, types of charging, costing assistance. Um, while at one point the provincial government was providing some assistance there, that is no longer the case, but there is some costing assistance federally, and then also return on investment, because I think that for most people in condos, you purchase your condo, but you also want it to have been a good investment, and if at some point for resale, you want to show what kind of amenities the building has, I think that having um, chargers would is a wonderful amenity to have going into the future. So I 
uh, proceeded by just speaking to them about the fact that as EVs become more popular, that um, lots of people in Ontario are going to require charging stations and having them installed residentially, commercially and industrially across the province, they seem to increase property values, attract customers to retail locations, and just wanted to go over some of the benefits of having EV charging stations, and that it was a significant opportunity for the condominium to increase the value of the facility by installing those kinds of um, charging stations. So then I spoke to the um, Condominium Act and um, the sections that apply. So what I have at the end of this presentation actually is an outline of that act, just showing you all the various steps that you have to go through. If it is that you're in a condominium and you're approaching the board as an individual, or whether um, or not it is that they are looking installing, there are some steps and some time limits in regards to your approaching the board when you're requesting that. And that document is at the end of this presentation. So I'm not gonna go into that in detail. So some of the benefits of electric charging in a multi-unit residential building would be um, retention and attraction, as I mentioned previously. Um, residential property developers and owners in a lot of newer buildings, our building is older, but they are actually building them with the charging stations in them, recognizing that that will be something that will attract individuals who want to purchase in their buildings. They're considered an amenity when it is that it comes to the building, and they can also be an alternate revenue stream. So if it is that the condo is hesitant in regards to that, then perhaps addressing it as an alternate revenue stream may be helpful as well, because you can put in chargers where it is that people have to pay to charge their vehicles. So that can be beneficial. And as the as, the, as times change, I personally believe that they'll become more of a necessity than an amenity when it comes to condo buildings. So there are some steps in the process and um, Randall, who's gonna to speak to you later is much better versed in this than I, because this is just information that I extracted from the internet, wherever it is that I could find it. But it talks about you requiring a load study. So to see whether or not the building can accommodate the additional load of having electric chargers. And then based on that study can be determined just how many chargers it is that can be supported. And so then also just looking at power sharing, central locations, um, would there be in the building specific spots that people would go to to charge or would you have chargers at each individual parking spot and parking location? So those kinds of things, tap cards that can be used in order to access the chargers. And um, one of the things that I'd read, and I'm hoping that perhaps Randall or it perhaps even Brian can provide some additional insight into this has to do with um, whether or not you should stay away from individual or level one chargers. What it is that I was able to um, assess from what it from what I read on the internet was that you should stay away from um, level one chargers and it's better to go to a metered system where it is that people are paying for the electricity. But most definitely, I believe that at the end of the day, it would be an added value to the building. There are various types of charging. And so I already mentioned that there's something called level one, but there's three different types of charging. And things may have changed since I presented this, but what I could find was level one is a slow charge. So it takes a lot longer in order for it to charge the vehicle. There's a faster charge at level two and a rapid charge at level three. So if it was that in the building, people were mainly going to be using the chargers overnight, then you may be able to get away with something that is a slower charge and as a result doesn't use as much electricity. But if it is that people want a more rapid charge, then you'd have to look at the other levels that are available when it comes to charging vehicles. And there are all kinds of different management systems and ways in which it is that you can control how that work. So like I mentioned, where it is that individuals can pay for the power that they use by using a tap card that they can get credit on those various ways or whether or not the building themselves just wants to take full ownership of the entire system. But there are various ways in which it is that um, you can manage the um, charging of the vehicle. 
and then the kinds of um, support it is for the electric vehicle and the infrastructure in multi-residential buildings. And so the output and the input as far as the electricity that's used, definitely not my area of expertise, but I thought it was important that I presented something that spoke to that for the, when I was presenting to my condo board. As far as return on investment goes, I was able to pull this up and it comes from um, one of the documents that's an appendices to this. And it just speaks to dependent on the number of users and how often it is that they use the chargers, what you can look at for return for investment when it is that you install these systems, especially if it is that you're charging individuals to use the electricity. So it just speaks to most definitely as the numbers go up, and the number of people that are using the system and the charge that it is that you, the charge that they are paying, then the um, return on investment can increase as far. And so it may be beneficial to the building if it is that they are considering having that initial outlay of funds to look at the fact that you can get some return on that money. And so the other thing, sorry, I'm just gonna stop sharing with you for a moment. I think I have stopped sharing, is that then I just had appendices that were attached to this that further outlaw, I'm sorry, further show what it is that the law says as far as the condo, the act, and then also just what it is that there was that was available in regards to government monies that may be available to assist from the federal government. And I will leave it at that. Thank you. Carol, you're on mute. You are on mute, Carol. Sorry, I just said that was that was wonderful, and uh, and I'm going to go back and listen to the recording to get some of that information into my head again that you were saying. And and so, what is it that you were going to share with us at the end? I'm not entirely clear on that. You're on mute. <laughs> uh, I'm on mute. What I have is just the appendices that went along with the PowerPoint. So, um, so there are just some additional documents that I'm happy to upload and share with you or provide to you that just support the information that it is that was contained in the PowerPoint. Okay, so where could we could we find that? Will that be in the chat or will that be will that be going? How would you like me to upload it for you? I'm going to ask Alex that question. Alex, how was the best way for Anne to upload that information? Let's have that discussion offline. And when we put up uh, our link on the events page um, with the video of this, we'll also include a link to wherever we place that information. Perfect. Oh, that sounds perfect. That's the best way to do it. Okay, that's great. Thank so you. What I will do then is, Alex, shall I send that information to you or shall I send it to Carol? Send it to Alex, I would say. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, I'll get that off to you right away. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. So you can see that basically Anne has done a lot of research, a lot of work figuring out what she had to present to the condo board to be able to make them see that it was possible to do this. And it's a volunteer condo board. So, you know, people don't have oodles of time to be able to like sort through all this stuff and, and to be able to present it to them like that so that then they can have a much better chance of, of going forward with action on this. So now our, our last speaker, we're going to stop the recording at this point.